I was totally engaged right from the beginning. Uh, one thing Danny did in his original script was start it in the middle. Hey, Phil? Phil? Ned? One of the first things we told Danny when we met, we said, we, we love that it starts in the middle. Uh, you know, one thing, we, we don't want to, you know, drop that. We're going we're gonna to keep that. That's, that's very hip. It's very cool that you started right, you know, with the thing already happening. This is Tom. He worked in the coal mine until they closed the town. And her? It's Alice. Came over here from Ireland when she was a baby. She lived in Erie most of her life. He's right. Of course, the first thing we did when, when I started rewriting it was uh, Whitney White, our, our development executive, said, uh, well, you know, isn't it kind of... Don't you think the audience will feel cheated if they don't see his reaction to the, to the onset of the time warp? I said, eh, maybe. She said, well, well, you know, why don't you just write it, you know, and see, you know, if you don't like it, you don't have to use it. So, of course, I wrote it and we kept it. The other thing we told Danny we'd never do, which uh, one thing we thought was totally cool about his script was he never explained where the time warp, why it happened. You know, what, what is the cosmological source of it? Is, is it astronomical or is it, is it karma? You know, what is it? We didn't know. What the hell? Harold? Ready? Harold, can you hear me? Yeah. Are you a director or a stylist? Okay, ready? All right. He, he seems to come by the nasty part, quite honestly, the self-centeredness and all. And Bill Murray really does understand that character. I mean, you know, you know he's not a movie star by accident. Uh, you know, he has, he, he understands vanity and self-centeredness. I'd like to dedicate this take to Peter, a guy who's kept me in focus more often than he hasn't. Thanks, man. Um, so it, it made him the perfect guy to play that. Someday somebody's going to see me interviewing a ground. I think I don't have a future. She was so natural. She just was cracking up. Bill was making her laugh so much, and they looked, they were so wonderful together, and there was a very strong uh, Beauty and the Beast quality. Not only am I rough and tough, but I don't bathe that much. People give me a lot of space. <laughs> I believe that. She is kind of luminous, you know. I mean, she has this perfect, you know, skin and 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 uh, lovely natural quality. And, and Bill is, you know, he's he's, you know, a few miles of you know rough road there. You know, he's uh, and yet, you know, they looked great together. And she seemed to really just enjoy him so much. I had great admiration for him. I loved wa watching him work, and I didn't mind for one minute being the straight person with him because. I cannot do what he does, but I don't think anybody can. I mean, that's what makes him so special. Ned! Ryerson! Stephen Toblowski is Ned Ryerson. I mean, you know, he's, he's played a lot of goofy guys and a lot of unsavory characters in movies, but probably n never anyone as delightfully wacky as this guy. Uh, you know, people really remember Ned. For my first audition, I went in, I said, you know, Harold, I worked on this yesterday some at home and I think it's getting kind of big it's getting a little broad you know you may need a spatula to scrape me off the walls but I'm going to go for it okay and we're, we're just gonna do it just tell me just just kick me out of here just kick me out and you know so we started go oh Bill, Bill yeah you have... do you have life insurance Phil because if you do, you could always use a little more, right? <laughs> I mean, who couldn't? In Punxsutawney, the Groundhog Festival happens in a park quite removed from the center of town. But the size of the town square in Woodstock allowed us to put this Groundhog Ceremony right there in the heart of town, which just galvanized the whole Groundhog Day experience in a really perfect way, you know. It, it made the, the town was a character in the film. It was a cold that came up through the ground, and you couldn't stop it. It was a cold that came up through the ground, up through your feet, into your knees, to where your knees were shaking, your hips were shaking inside your clothes. Your jaw would be, you'd want to get your jaw and tongue working before the scene because it was so cold. Will you wait? Yeah? Yeah. Will you wait right? Good God almighty. We started in winter and finished in, in spring, so there, there was this quite natural progression, even in our own mood, of opening up into, into springtime, you know. Uh, and it, it's the way the, the, it's the emotional arc of the film, and it, it was the, the reality of doing the movie over the, the spanning the winter into spring. There's discussion as to what the day of the movie was going to be. Because we were shooting in upstate Illinois on the Wisconsin border, did we want it to be a sunny day? Did we want it to be a snowy day? Did we want it to be a cloudy day? Because it would have to be the same day over and over again. It's Groundhog Day. It's still just once a year, isn't it? Whenever 
Phil walks down the street from the bed and breakfast, we shot them one, two, three, one after another. So we always knew where we were. We, we finished him in one, mo one mood, and we still had the same background, same extras, same cars, on the same cycle, going, you know, at ex everyone going at exactly the same time, with Bill being the only different element. He'd be the only changed element. So I could say to him, all right, you know, in, we'd, first we do the one where it's, it's normal day, and you're just, you know, hurrying along, and you st now in the second day you're a little confused, and the third day you're very confused and desperate. By shooting them one right after the other, we, it was really easy to see the, how we were progressing it, you know, and, and, and what it would look like on screen. That last sequence, I remember Bill was just saying, like, uh, I'm just going to vamp with this. Uh, he says, I'm just going to go with this. Uh, I'm going to grab you and just go with it. I said, why don't you just give him a hug and don't let go. Make it uncomfortably long, you know? I don't know where you're headed, but can you call in sick? Uh, <laughs> I got to get going. If you have a director who likes people and is generous and kind, then you're going to have a great experience. And Harold is all of that plus much more. In Danny Rubin's uh, original script, you know, when Danny and I talked about it, Danny imagined him living this day over and over for thousands of years. He goes from being a prisoner of that time and place to being master of that time and place. It's not about being the hero of the town. It's about doing what you can do in the moment to make things better instead of making things worse. If other people interpret that as you being the god of the town, which in a way he becomes, so be it. But that isn't his aim. I'll see you tomorrow, maybe. Well, I used to use a Superman analogy with Bill. How can Superman waste time talking to Lois Lane? There's always going to be some submarine trapped somewhere or, you know, someone falling off someplace. You know, he should be booked constantly, solidly. You know, and he doesn't even need to sleep. This guy should be working, you know, 24-7 to protect people. So I thought with Phil Connors, you know, he's got plenty of time. He, you know, his day would be really packed with, oh, got to catch the kid falling from the tree, you know? <laughs> and, you know, oh, now i got to help the old ladies with the tire. It's nothing, ma'am. I had the tire and the jack. Just be comfortable, all right? Give a minute. When he stops worrying about himself all the time and, and starts living a life of service to others, you know, then uh, his life gets very, you know, full and rich indeed. You know, when he embraces where he is and, and, and what he can do. It's it hard down there at the bottom. You know, at first, his interest in her is sort of perfunctory. She's the best possibility in town. She's the best looking woman in town and most interesting and sophisticated. We, we could presume that's mock romantic i mean you know it's it for for phil it's you know it's like romance you know i, I love you and she said how do you love me how can you love me you don't even know me you know I, said, I know you you know it's like and he's trying to look like a guy in love there's that one scene where he it's so funny where he's in the snowbank he's repeated it. he's pulled her down in the snowbank and he's trying to just recapture the moment that they had before but he's actually trying to find the physical place where where, where she loved me once when I did this, you know, and he, he can't find it again. And I've, I've experienced that. Someone who's doing a pretty good job of pulling it off, and then you find out they're not so nice. <laughs> and you're just kind of stunned. It's like, wait a minute, you were acting different. I don't think we really want Bill to get the girl. I think we detest Bill and his smugness at the beginning. I think one of the miracles of the movie is that during the course of the movie, we want boy to get girl. I think that you could tell that Bill's character was really suffering, though. Even though, I mean, he was explosive and, and mean and cynical and all those things, there were, you, you felt sorry for him because you knew he couldn't be happy like that. And you see this other person that's peaceful and generous and kind and... And so you're thinking, why can't this person that's suffering so much find peace and hook up with this other peaceful person and be happy? So I think, you know, it's just it's a generous nature of uh, human beings to see someone who's obviously in pain and suffering, even though they're a total jerk, to wish for them to not be like that. She won't put up with anything. If As soon as he falls off the, the turnip truck with some line of bull, he's out of there. Slap in the face, slap in the face. That whole sequence in the middle, slap, 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 slap. Because he's not living up to the standards of excellence. The greatest gift for him 
is becoming finite again. He's going to die. He's going to age. Time is going to go on. But now he has the keys to use his time well. And to begin that journey of time, he wakes up and he's with his beloved. And the first inkling I got of what it was going to mean to me was uh, someone called and said, the Buddhists love this movie. And then I meet a yogi who says, oh, this is the yoga movie. I mean, you know, the, the, this totally expresses our philosophy. Then I start getting letters from Jesuits, from fundamentalist Christians, uh, all saying the same thing. This is, you know, you, you must be one of us because this movie perfectly expresses, you know, our philosophy of life. I think, you know, what, what Danny and I both wanted to say with the movie was, you know, you can live better, you can have a better life, you, people can change, you know, and when you do change, you get those rewards that you think you want from life.